Artificial intelligence is potentially transforming dermatology, offering faster diagnoses, greater accuracy, and expanded access to care. It is one of the most discussed topics in the medical field, primarily because of the debate over whether it will improve things for patients or not. In this feature, we explore the cutting-edge research driving this revolution. Three leading experts with differing specialties share their insights on how AI is reshaping skin disease detection, enhancing clinical decision-making, and pushing the boundaries of dermatological care. They also share their own views on whether or not AI is worth the attention it's currently receiving. Join us as we dive into the future of AI in dermatology. Our three experts first spoke with us about their views on AI technology's use in dermatology. We spoke with Dr. Steve Shu from the Feinberg School of Medicine, Dr. Harold Kittler of the Medical University of Vienna, and Kyla Svodrahali, a PhD candidate in electrical engineering at Stanford University. I think for me, AI is incredible because it, it's both a microscope and a telescope. And I think the whole generative side is also incredible because it can also generate things, right? That, that before, you know, looking at data and analyzing it was sort of one major use case. The last six, six or seven years when the, with the invention of convolutional networks for image-based diagnosis, well, convolutional networks were always there, but uh, they got better and better. And with also with the increase in the number of images that were available, available to train those networks. For diagnostic assistance in dermatology, I think there's a lot of potential. We've seen a lot of models come out in the past few years that have very good accuracy over a wide range of skin tones, which is you know, one of the big challenges. You can't just diagnose one disease. You have to care about thousands of diseases. Um, but I think one of the big limitations still is in diagnosing uh, different skin tones and other, other issues related to demographics where a lot of the data, at least in the U.S., has been focused on lighter skin tones. And that's, been, that's really been a huge limitation. And so generalizing beyond that, I think, is super important. We also asked the three experts about their own research on different AI technologies and their uses in addressing different dermatologic conditions. This originally was motivated um, by noticing that you know, during the pandemic, there was a huge spike in telemedicine visits. And for dermatology, one of the uh, pieces of that visit is people sending in photos before the actual doctor visit. And what we noticed there is that a lot of the photos being sent in were just poor quality and sufficiently poor quality that the doctors couldn't actually make a diagnosis or do anything with that photo. And the problem with that is if you have a useless photo, the visit's either not going to be useful or you have to have someone call the person up or message them and tell them how to correct the photo and have them retake it and resend it in and all that stuff. Um, and the, the main issue with that is that's a huge time sink for doctors who have limited time already. And so from there, we basically thought, can this be automated? Can we build an AI component into this that just checks the photos and if it's not good enough, tells people why it's not good enough to lessen the load on doctors and make the whole system more efficient. And I think, um, I think problems like this are very interesting because they're not necessarily focused on diagnosis or things that the doctor directly does, but it's, it's trying to support them in their work to make it more efficient and make, uh, you know, make their time better used. So for this study, actually the endpoints is a very interesting thing. So our perspective on it was we wanted to show that with our AI tool, people can take better photos. And you know, one of the metrics you can get from that is how much time is going to be saved. You know, of course, you're estimating, but how much time is going to be saved for nurses or doctors having to contact patients about their bad photos. Um, and so but one, of the, one of the challenges there is in doing the study, we were also trying to convince um, upper management at, at Sanford Hospital that this is a really valuable thing. And unfortunately, they were not completely clear with us what the best metric is for them. Um, so we we're kind of playing around with some different things. But the main one we ended up using is, um, you know, what is, there's actually there's two, I guess. The first, the primary one being for the AI was um, what is the, what is the AUC curve, which is just a uh, you know, it's, it, would be, it would be similar to saying what, what is the accuracy of this model in predicting bad photos, except it's not exactly that because it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to be perfect accuracy. What we care more about is a combination of is it detecting the correct photos that are poor quality and is it not detecting the, the high quality photos? And the reason for that, of course, is you don't want to tell people their photo is bad when it actually isn't. That just wastes time. Um, so it's, it's kind of a metric that takes in those two factors together and combines them. Um, but the downstream metric we were also caring about is if you implement this in the existing system and you know the performances as we see in, in this in this uh, trial, um, how much time is going to be saved for clinicians? How much time is going to be extra extra time is going to be spent by the patients taking the photos? Turns out very little. 
And so uh, overall, basically, there is, you know, you could estimate thousands of hours being saved per year for clinicians at a hospital like Stanford. So that, that, was, the, that was the finding we got at. We started off this journey almost four or five years ago where, you know, we developed soft, wearable, flexible devices that conform to the skin. So it's really material science innovation. Uh, so you think about it, like, why do we have electronics strapped to your wrist? It's not because that's where the data is. It's where it's convenient to put electronics. But if you have skin-like soft, flexible sensors that you can put anywhere, there's areas of rich information. And so as a dermatologist and an engineer, we're like, we know how important that symptom of itch is, right? Atopic dermatitis, the hallmark symptom is itch, but it's very hard to like quantify that, right? Because we just ask people, like, how itchy are you? And try doing that with a four-year-old or a six-year-old, right? And that's hard. Or even asking someone, how, how much did you scratch overnight? It's really hard to say. So we started off developing this sensor and wearable on the hand that can capture all the different ways we scratch, which is kind of complicated. You have the fingers, the hand, that's 99% accurate. But as a clinician, um, I'm like, that's not enough value for my patients to like do stuff, right? So, so many of my patients scratch kind of subconsciously. I've had so many patient visits where it's like, how's your you know, month? Like, how's your view of your medicine? And they're just kind of scratching, you know, because they're itchy. So there's a big sort of behavioral component to scratching. So we thought, hey, we can calculate scratching really accurately with our AI algorithm. Can we do some innovation on the technology side, make that AI algorithm really, really uh, simplified, but, but not lose accuracy that can run on a wearable. So it doesn't require a computer, doesn't require NVIDIA chips. You know, the whole world is blowing up because DeepSeek did it for six million instead of a billion. So that's kind of like another analogy. What we did was we take our, you know, complex CNN and we actually put that directly on a wearable, which is a lot less computing power than a smartwatch or a smartphone. So the device can then automatically detect when you're scratching and actually deliver a little buzz to say, hey, maybe you should not do that, right? And that's exciting for me as a dermatologist because we want to break that itch scratch cycle. And it was very exciting to see that we really decreased that scratching, both events as well as duration by 28% and 40%. And we didn't wake anybody up because it's a very subtle little buzz that doesn't sort of disturb you from sleep. So I think that was a cool thing. AI can be helpful in interpreting images like in radiology or in pathology. So dermatology is a, is a good use case for that and skin cancer uh, specifically, but not only skin cancer. So making diagnosis based from images is a very easy task for AI. And uh, um, I think this is not solved, but it's it's already far. And um, the reason why we don't see it uh, so much in practice, so when you go to the doctor, uh, she or he still takes out his or her dermatoscope and looks at uh, her skin with her own eyes and uh, doesn't use an eye, is that there is a gap between the promise and uh, what the systems are currently offering in terms of how they can be integrated in our workflow. And this is the main obstacle now. These, uh, so AI can do great with regard to diagnostic accuracy, not only with skin cancer, but the skin cancer is the best example. And skin cancer is an easy use case because the differential diagnosis is limited, it's just like playing chess with only two pieces on the board or three pieces. But dermatology or general dermatology is much more difficult because you have more diagnosis. We then spoke with the three experts about potential barriers to AI's implementation in the medical world, as well as views among clinicians and the general public about its use. I mean, first is like, does it work, right? And then technology has to prove that. I think that's why we publish peer-reviewed journals because, you know, that goes through the most rigorous reviews and, and data, you know, assessment. So I think technology has got to really work. I think one of the biggest bottlenecks is just well-labeled, you know, digital data biobanks, right? That's very hard to do. I think Stanford's doing some great work in there, but how do you make sense of what's available? And Northwestern too, under Dr. Powler, Amy Powler, my chair, doing a lot of great work in organizing that data, making it useful because, you know, what your data set is determines the use. So I think that's going to be a big bottleneck, very important to invest in that infrastructure. It's not cool it's not sexy it's like you're not developing a technology but those are incredibly important the third is regulatory right these are medical devices like these are not things you can just say 
we can diagnose melanoma and put it on a, a website, right? These are serious things. And so I think we need to be able to do rigorous, well-designed trials, work with the FDA, work with, you know, uh, Udemed and, and, and the regulators to be able to, you know, Japanese uh, PMDA so that, you know, what we say is proven and, and evaluated by regulators. So I think that is an important step. I wouldn't say it's a bottleneck, but it's really critical we, we get that right. And then I think the last one is real world evidence, right? You know, when you sort of release these kind of new technologies, we, we can't anticipate all the different kind of uses, how that's going to impact clinical care, these kind of things. So I think that's going to be another problem that we have to address and think about. In terms of do doctors want AI in, in healthcare? Um, I would say my view is going to be a bit biased because I'm at Stanford where there's a lot of collaborations between doctors in Stanford Hospital and engineers in the engineering school, like with me. Um, so in, at Stanford, they very much want it. Outside of Stanford, what I've heard from my doctor friends is there sometimes can be pushback because doctors are worried about being replaced. The perspective that I have and a lot of us at Stanford has, from, you know, based on the conversations I've had with them, is that we don't want to replace doctors. I actually think that's, that's really important because they're uh, you know, ignoring even ignoring all the technical knowledge that they have, there's a very important human relation component to medicine that I think you really cannot and do not want to remove. Um, and so the perspective is we want to help augment doctors. So it's, it's not to replace them, it's to help them. And I think um, from that perspective, I think doctors are happy to do it. Patients, of course, they have no problem with it if they can get better advice and quicker advice and advice at home and all this stuff. Like, why would they not want it? And so I think I think there is a strong push, but there is this tension of are people going to be replaced and so on. And and I think the answer should be no. I, I don't think you need to replace people. I think there are early adopters who love it and are curious, and there are critical people who who hate it and who, who fear it. And uh, um, so I think the best way is to be somewhere in the middle, uh, meaning to be critical. Um, uh, so not to not to be a believer in everything that AI tells us, then we just, we turn ourselves to just computers that, that or just machines that are following AI recommendations. We still have to be humans. So uh, this is important to stay, uh, to be critical, but also to be, let's say, uh, not mm, well, too proud of our, uh, let's say, mm, uh, of our human intelligence, because um, if we, are curious, we'll see that AI does can do some amazing things we can't, and uh, it would be stupid not to take advantage of it. With all of this in mind, the experts were then asked about the future of AI's implementation and what remains to be explored. The main limitation that we had in building our, our AI system is the uh, lack of data, because we had to annotate our own data and this is expensive, you know. So like, like for example, um, if we want to know if a, a picture is good quality or not, we wanted to ask actual doctors what they thought. And the reason for that, is, as I mentioned to you earlier on, um, just the image being blurry is not sufficient to know that it's bad quality. It might be fine. It, it really depends on what the image is of. And so we actually you know, recruited a bunch of, um, of, of dermatologists, mostly residents, but also non-residents, non you know, actual you know, board-certified doctors and so on, to actually annotate these images. And that is not easy because there are limited quantities. There's a limited number of them. And uh, we're also restricted by data use restrictions. So we have to basically only go to Stanford, otherwise it's gonna be a huge hassle to do it. And it's also expensive. And so the data was a big limitation for us and how many images we can annotate. And um, for, you know, for machine learning, having a large amount of data is like, it's really important to do well. And so that was a big limitation for us. Um, I, I haven't actually tried this, but my guess would be using some of the newer Gen AI tools uh, that have been trained on literally billions of images we can leverage that better to uh, do some of this, do some of these tasks. Um, of course, there is a caveat there, and you, you know, you, everything we did was in house and local, so there's no issue of leaking private information, which you know is important in medicine. Uh, with some of these other tools, there might be more concern there, so you have to do it carefully. But I think there's probably some advancement that can be done by integrating these no, more modern um, models into the system, and you probably have better performance. Um, but but in and more easily to generalize beyond, let's say, just dermatology, which was one of the concerns of the Stanford Hospital. The best way to use the machine, machines currently and to use machine learning algorithms is in the hands of capable humans. And here, this is a problem. 
because if you still need capable humans to use the machines, then uh, um, what is what is the benefit of the machines? Um, don't we want to replace the capable humans by machines because capable humans are so sparse? And uh, yeah, so the answer is we still don't know for sure what are the best applications, but one could be, for example, to help humans in doing stuff that they don't like to do, like comparing images or comparing moles in a patient where one image has taken has been taken at baseline and the other image has been taken at three months or five months. And to compare all those moles immediately in a few seconds is impossible for humans, but machines can do this in a millisecond. But the decision will uh, what to do will, will, will remain in the hands of doctors or dermatologists or whoever is capable of doing that for a long time. There's so many patients with atopic dermatitis that could benefit just additional tools and technology. We've got aura rings and Apple watches. We're tracking our fitness. We're tracking our sleep. But for the, the atopic dermatitis patients out there, the most common inflammatory skin condition, you know, those things are important, but the scratching and itch, that's the main driver. So we just be able to provide that opportunity for patients to, to better engage and manage their condition, I think is, is really exciting, right? This is the future of medicine where we're blurring the lines of drugs, technology, AI, to really benefit patients in a very practical way. And I think that's that's what I'm excited about. So like as a technologist, I'm, I'm excited, I'm pumped about the future. I think, you know, AI is gonna change everything. It, it already has in many ways. But as a clinician, I'm also like, show me the proof, show me the value, show me that my patients like it and care about it and wanna do it. So I think it has to meet that sort of, you know, middle, but we're, we're very committed to, to getting this out there and scaling it uh, with the support of our partners. This has been an HCP Live video feature. Thank you for watching.